From the European Parliament here in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thanks for joining us tonight. Here's what's coming up. Referendum redo calls grow for another Brexit vote. But Theresa May warns that could do irreparable damage. Brexit stakes. We head to Northern Ireland to find out what's really at risk for people living along the border. Europe on rest. After another weekend of anti-government protests, we look at what's driving the anger. Your call. Forget about the pundits and the politicians. It's your chance to speak up as we launch a new call-in show. And raw content. You have voted. Now we reveal your favourite raw moments of 2018. Hello, good evening. Welcome to the programme. It's time first, though, to meet our panellists. First, I'm joined by Jennifer Baker. She is a Brussels-based uh, journalist and editor of the website brusselsgeek.com. Uh, Jennifer, good evening. What are you looking at today? Well, I think all the things you mentioned at the outset are very important, but I'm going to look at the big picture and the, uh, the nothing less than the whole future of our planet and climate change and what's been going on at COP24. Yeah, indeed. I've uh, been getting an awful lot of press uh, attention today. Uh, it is a big story, but there are a lot around today. Uh, Esther Zatlan is a reporter with the EU Observer. She's covering populism and Brexit, uh, keeping you busy, of course. Uh, what, what particularly one of those uh, stories catches your eye? I'm going to go with the unrest in Europe. As a Hungarian, I'm, I'm particularly fascinated by the opposition protest uh, gaining momentum in Hungary. Uh, and Andrew Byrne, he's the EU correspondent for the Sunday Times. Uh, Andrew? Can I guess what you're looking at today? It's not a hard one. It's Brexit, obviously. I mean, 18 months ago, if you'd said that a second referendum was a plausible outcome of this, people would have thought you were crazy. And yet now we have Theresa May's lieutenants lining up to say it's not going to happen, which I think is a sure sign that the probability has increased. Indeed it has. And that is uh, actually what we're leading with tonight. Irreparable damage and broken faith with the British people. That would be the consequences of a second referendum, according to the British Prime Minister, Theresa May. Her efforts to lead the UK through its divorce with the EU has divided Parliament so deeply that an increasing number of politicians are calling for a second Brexit vote as the only way to break the impasse. But the Prime Minister has rejected the idea, as has uh, many of her ministers as well. Well, I think the Prime Minister is absolutely right to rule out a second referendum. We asked the people to decide. Uh, they decided. They've put their faith in us and we mustn't let them down. We have to deliver on Brexit and that means we can't uh, come up with something else in Parliament. We have to deliver on that result. Would Thank you. you. Now, those remarks uh, came amidst calls from prominent British politicians for a revote. They included uh, former Prime Ministers John Major and Tony Blair. Now, I spoke to Mr Blair on Friday about his call for a second referendum, and he told me that he is actively lobbying EU leaders here in Brussels and indeed elsewhere to prepare for it. Uh, here's that part of our conversation. Uh, let's have a look. So you've been going around campaigning for this second referendum, and... I mean, I think it's fair to say lobbying other European leaders of its merits. I mean, how, who have you spoken to and, and how, how has that message gone down? Well, I don't disclose as the people I speak to because those, th th this should remain private between me and the leaders that I, I talk to. But um, I think it's very obvious what leaders were saying to me when I first started having this conversation a year ago. They would say to me, yeah, but it's never going to happen another referendum. I think the mood has changed in the last couple of months. And now people are saying, uh, well, could it really happen? I need to get the European leaders to the next stage, which is to realize the probability is it's going to happen and they've got to prepare for it. Because one important component in any such refought referendum will be whether Europe is prepared to meet what are not just British concerns around the issues to do with immigration, but are European-wide concerns. And I think you could put together the right type of deal, if you like, for which wouldn't just be about Britain, it would be about Europe and accepting that, for example, freedom of movement of people in Europe has got to operate in a way that's fair and just, doesn't undercut wages and doesn't cause problems for individual countries. And you can catch that full interview uh, tonight here on Euronews with the former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair. It airs at 9.45 at Central European Time uh, with me. But first, let's uh, talk to a panel about this idea of a second referendum. Uh, Andrew, let's start with you. You raised this. It is, in some ways, quite extraordinary uh, that the UK is now in the position of, of a second referendum. Um, 
Will it gain significant enough traction, though, in the Commons that it actually starts being a possibility and starts becoming a reality? Mm -hmm. I think what we, we're seeing now is such a level of parliamentary stalemate that basically because Theresa May's deal, the probability of it being passed has faded significantly, even more so after last week's summit of EU leaders, every other conceivable possibility now increases in probability. And most people I'm talking to think that a second referendum is simply the only way to, to resolve it. Um, Theresa May has ruled it out cons consistently. She's ruled it out firmly again today. She also ruled out calling an early referendum and she also ruled out many other things that since came to pass. So uh, it's hard to, to see, you know, how it comes through without a significant number of Labour MPs coming in behind it and a significant number of Tory MPs. There's perhaps at least 70 already who would, who would come out in favour of it. But day by day, I think the, the probability increases. But, but isn't the problem here, and I spent a lot of time, Jennifer, in the UK in the last week or so, and, um, you know, there is, a, there is a level of opinion just says that we, we just need to get out. Far from having another vote, they view this as almost, as Theresa May has been seen today, a betrayal of democracy. Well, I think one of the problems that hasn't seemed to have been addressed about a potential second referendum is what do you put on the ballot paper? Mm. What, what options do you give to the people? Do you give it Theresa May's deal, no deal or remain? Uh, in which case, no matter which option comes out top, it's going to be a minority option because you've got, you know, you're dividing the electorate by three instead of by two. And I think that is something that the British populace doesn't really come to terms with. It's a first-past-the-post system. There isn't proportional representation. So this whole question of how you even go about making that referendum work technically will be very complicated. Um, but also there's this idea that many British people feel that Tony Blair is essentially a traitor. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sense that you got from Downing Street over the weekend in reaction to that interview you, saying that what is he doing undermining Theresa May's negotiations by telling other EU leaders, hold firm and you'll get a second referendum? I mean, that's a very interesting angle. And <clears throat> uh, Prime Minister Blair mentioned something really interesting, like coming up with a migration pact before any second mm. referendum. I find that highly unlikely that the EU would in, engage in any sort of negotiation that would curb, for example, freedom of movement, as he said. So I think what's really interesting to see is how would the EU react to any sort of second referendum. Mm. The EU has said this is the deal on the table and it's not likely mm. to change. And it, it also necessitates, I mean, if there is to be a second referendum, there will have to be an extension of the Article 50 yeah, exactly. deadline, which means that we're <laughs> going to be talking about this for months, if not years. But, 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 but are the British people going to buy an EU army, which Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel have talked about recently? Are they going to buy, uh, essentially, potentially a uh, deeper Eurozone? And is the EU going to allow greater reform or movement on the free movement of people? Mm. I think who buys what very much depends on who's selling it. And I think actually Tony Blair is probably the wrong person to be trying to sell a second people's yeah. vote. I mean, he, he said that he thinks European leaders would be willing to give a special arrangement or at least reform freedom of movement rules if the EU was to come back in. I think there actually is a willingness among EU leaders to look at that question, but not as some not kind of carrot or weeks. incentive but to, also to, in, to also get in the UK back in. I mean, you're right, the deadline is so tight. It's not going to happen yeah. in the next couple of months. It, no. it takes Europe years to decide yeah. anything. And they all also have uh, sort of a bad experience with negotiating with the UK, with David Cameron, to appease some of the concerns of the UK public or UK mm -hmm. politicians because before the first referendum there was an agreement between the EU and the UK to reform the EU but that wasn't featured in the referendum campaign at all so I think there there is a reluctance to do that again and and come to the same mm -hmm. result. It's a bit like democracy and it's the second referendum it's the worst idea apart from all the other ideas <laughs> that are out there. But isn't also the, the truth of the matter that when you listen to the pollsters over the weekend that, Pollsters get things wrong from time to time, but when you listen to them, they reiterate, Jennifer, that there has not been any great shift in public opinion in the last two years. And thus, if there was a referendum, the assumption that somehow Remain would win is not necessarily true. Well, I think to say pollsters sometimes get things wrong <laughs> is a dramatic <laughs> understatement if you look, particularly in the UK over the last few elections. But, I mean, there's, there's, there has been something of a shift. It was a very tight margin one way or the other. You've got people whose votes didn't count for various reasons. We've got all the young people who have come of suffrage mm. since the actual, mm. you know, in the last two years. So, I mean, those small things could make a big difference. Well, it's always going to be tight. Though. It is interesting they're talking about giving votes to 16 and 17 year olds and potentially to EU nationals as well. Of course, we're denied... Mm. 
uh, the vote in, in 2016. But this is not new, is it really? Revisiting the outcome of a big vote with a second referendum has happened before here in Europe, particularly, of course, in the European Union. Denmark and Ireland have both held second referendums on EU treaties within 18 months of the first vote. Uh, Denmark held their second referendum to prove the Maastricht Treaty in 1993 after it had been rejected uh, the year before. And Ireland's second referendums were held for Nice in 2002 and the Lisbon Treaty in 2008. In all cases, the EU got its way and the no results from the first vote were uh, uh, reversed. Isn't that the extraordinary thing is that you're, we have been here before multiple mm, times. Yeah, I think it's fair to note, though, that countries that have referendums to decide issues generally, as a rule, will come back to issues without substantiating. I mean, you mentioned Ireland. I'm Irish myself. And I think on the issue of abortion, which was resolved this year and was legalised, it was the sixth referendum uh, over mm. several decades on yep. the same question. So I don't think, I mean, it's hard to sustain the argument that having a referendum on another topic is in itself always undemocratic. But the question is, has something changed or have people learned something since the last but, 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 but isn't that the problem, Esther, that actually the UK is not like other EU nations. It is not used to. This is, was only the third... I think, UK-wide referendum ever. So it's not used to having referendums. And so this referendum is held in higher esteem than for other countries like Denmark or Ireland, for example. That could cause trouble within the UK, or political trouble. But mm. I think from an EU perspective, the UK is just like any other members in the still 28 member bloc. So from that perspective, I think the EU sees it as a UK internal political debate. They've agreed to the uh, withdrawal agreement and that now they're waiting how the UK will sort this out. And Jennifer, do you think this does any damage to, if there was a second vote, for example, do you think it damages the EU to a degree that yet again it seems that essentially Brussels just just gets its way. Well, we'll keep asking you until you give us the right answer sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, I mean, and, but then again, as you mentioned, those, those other cases, you know, and I think one of the best indicators of future behaviour is past behaviour. So it's very likely that if there is a second vote, it'll happen because, you know, EU forces and those in the UK will believe that it's going to be a different outcome, mm. as Andrew says. It's, there's no point having it if nothing has changed mm. or if people haven't learned anything. But we now know an awful lot about the misinformation, disinformation campaign that was going on. And so that may have changed people's minds. Uh, just very finally, so referendum, yes or no, do you reckon it's going to happen? No. No? I don't think so. You don't think so? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to be a yes then. 50-50. <laughs> There we go. Uh, insights like that. <laughs> OK, well, uh, let's stick with Brexit, because if you need a recap on how the first referendum played out, uh, well, we're just going to provide it for you now, so you're in luck. That's because the Brexit blockbuster is due to premier next year. It really, really was only a matter of time. With a star-studded cast, the trailer almost, almost makes it look exciting. <laughs> Everyone knows who won, but not everyone knows how. We are about to ask the biggest question in a generation, in or out, and we need a leader. How to change the course of history? We have to hack the political system. Hack it. I'm talking about altering the matrix of politics. Social media platforms are designed to find like-minded people. People who don't and have never voted. Three million extra votes that the other side have no idea exist. This is an insurgence against the establishment. We're going to build something. What are your expectations, realistically? To create the biggest political upset since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Let's take back control! Let's take back control! What's your edge? What have you found? There is a new politics in town. One that you cannot control. Uh, it was inevitable. A very, very thin-looking Boris Johnson uh, mm. there in that trailer. Um, Jennifer, you were suggesting you might have thought it was a spoof. I genuinely <laughs> wasn't sure that Benedict Cumberbatch might not have made this sort of little short spoof video. It took me, it took me reading about it to believe it was actually happening. It looks very exciting. There's an awful lot of walking with purpose going on. <laughs> 
I think it's it's a bold move by HBO to think that people will actually want to spend their yeah, leisure aren't we, time. Aren't we all bored Brexit. with Brexit? I'm sick of it. I'd much rather take give me Sherlock Holmes any day <laughs> over Brexit a, for I'm my leisure time. I'm a political nerd, so I'm actually really excited about this. But I think there is a slight suggestion in the movie that it's all about political engineering and the voters mm -hmm. don't have a responsibility in there. So I'm hoping that that's not, not the direction where the film. Yeah, doesn't it? It feeds into this idea that somehow everyone was tricked when ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, that that is a pretty political position to take. Many people mm. would say the British people voted fairly and squarely for this and they wanted it. No, that does look like a political stance, That certainly from that trailer. Yeah. But, you know, all the best bits are put in a trailer. We don't know if the whole film could just yeah. be you know, 18 months of boredom. Yeah, three, <laughs> three hours of codicils uh, and protocols. Yeah, I suspect it probably won't be a blockbuster, but we'll, we'll, we'll watch out for it when it comes out. Now, the Irish border, though, and these Brexit negotiations remains uh, still the central sticking point when it comes to Theresa May's withdrawal deal. It's certainly one of the reasons it's not likely at the moment to get through Parliament. And NBC's Bill Neely has gone to the Irish border for your news uh, to talk to people there about what's at stake. Let's have a look at his report. The Irish border, more open than almost any in the world, with more roads crossing it than between the US and Canada, or Russia and Eastern Europe. The border runs right down the middle of this river, and here in the town, it's invisible. I'm crossing now from Ireland into the UK. Easy. And that's the way people here want it to stay. Today already I was across the border maybe five times. You've been across five times today? Yeah. And that's perfectly normal? And perfectly normal for anybody here. So road closures? Be a disaster. After Brexit, this will be Britain's only land border with the European Union. There are real fears here that if Britain crashes out of the EU without a deal, a so-called hard border will be imposed. So the border goes through the lake. There, yes. are, there are British fish and Irish fish. Yes. <laughs> John Sheridan dreads the return of border controls. Customs officials, police, soldiers, soldiers. of two countries. Yes. It was militarised yes. and it was a pain in the neck. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's all gone. Reviving a guarded border wouldn't be easy. This church is in the UK. Its graveyard is in Ireland. In our eyes, there's no border. We just go about our life as normal. And that's the way it should stay? Of course, it has to stay like that. The old border posts are abandoned, but hardline British Brexiteers would put them back so Britain could be free forever of EU ties. And that prospect stirs fears here of violence. You put up physical infrastructure that people can protest at, or God forbid somebody can attack, the genie gets out of the bottle very quick. The genie of violence? Yes, possibly, yes. It might never, it'll never be, we hope it never happen. It'll never be on the scale, but you would see sporadic attacks, absolutely. The border is the center of the Brexit battle, but for decades it was literally a battleground. Memorials to the dead litter the borderlands, the scene of some of the worst massacres of Northern Ireland's long conflict. The violence here claimed three and a half thousand lives and there is a real fear that a chaotic British exit from the European Union could rekindle conflict. It could bring the troubles back. Bring the violence back. It could bring the violence back. We have 30 years of continuous war, it was horrific. It's nice the life we have now with peace. Peace in Northern Ireland made the border open and free. In one border village where dead gunmen are celebrated, a threat if Britain forces a hard border. Do you really think that we're going to have them coming in to date us again? I would say let's go back to war. War and economic collapse are the twin fears of the tight-knit communities that straddle the border. 55% of our lamb goes to the south for processing, 35% of our milk travel south for processing. That could be completely shattered, so our business could be ruined and the future of our family and our children uh, could also be ruined. It's that serious? It's that serious, absolutely. If we got a hard border in Northern Ireland, it would be desperate. It would really be the end of Northern Ireland. For now, Britain wants to avoid a hard border by tying the UK into the customs union, the controversial, unpopular backstop. Here, they're afraid that'll be ditched and their open border sacrificed. 
with dangerous consequences. A minority here did vote for Brexit. If we're going to do Brexit, let's do it and be done with. The majority have just one word for it. It's a mess, like it is just a total mess. A mess thousands in Northern Ireland want to escape by getting Irish passports to remain EU citizens. Six, seven, eight times the normal volume of passports since the Brexit vote came in about two years ago. People looking for Irish passports? Looking for Irish passports, yes. But there's neither a pot of gold nor reassurance at the end of the Irish border rainbow. Just risk of ruin and of a return to a dark past. In just over a hundred days, Britain will leave the European Union, the biggest change in its status in 50 years. But some things won't change. The country will remain bitterly divided. The ruling Conservative Party will still be at war over Europe. And peace and prosperity here in Northern Ireland will be threatened and fragile. It didn't want to leave the EU, it will be forced to. And so an old wound, a scar in Ireland's green will reopen and nobody knows what damage that might do. Bill Neely, NBC News for Euronews on the Irish border. Uh, Bill Neely there reporting uh, from uh, the Irish uh, border. I have to say somewhere um, actually I grew up, uh, I know very, very well. And listening to people's stories there, it's actually the sense um, of almost uncertainty. No one quite knows what's going to happen and that's what playing on people's minds. Mm. I think so, and I think the Irish government has made clear that it, it is simply inconceivable that we'll, it'll have to implement some kind of hard border, uh, which means that without the backstop in place, who knows what could happen. Well, isn't that the point? Is the, the fear there is that Northern Ireland could go back to its very dark past, Jennifer? Well, I mean, no one's going to thank you for that sort of happening. I mean, I, I, my family's from Belfast. I remember crossing that border as a child all the time. And back then, we had armed soldiers at the borders because in an effort to kind of clamp down on sectarian violence. One would hope, even if there is a border, that it will simply be an inconvenience and not a, a return mm. to, to violence, because no one's going to thank any politician for that. Uh, so have you been surprised by how much Ireland has received solidarity from the rest of the EU? I think that was one of the key aspects of, of the EU negotiations, how much the 27 have been able to keep uh, together. But uh, one of the commentators in the clip said, you know, peace is nice. And I think that's also what kept uh, the EU together on the Irish issue, is to maintain peace in the Ireland on the island of Ireland, because the EU is fundamentally a peace project. Indeed, and this uh, Brexit debate uh, shows no sign of ending. Guys, thank you very much indeed. We are going to take a quick break, but coming up here on Raw Politics, don't forget we're going to launch our new, brand new call-in show tonight. We want to hear what you think about the possibility of a second referendum on Brexit. Do get in touch with us. Use the hashtag Raw Politics and tune in at 7pm CET time. But coming up on this programme, from Brussels to Budapest, there's been an uptick in large anti-government protests in Europe. We take a look at why protesters are so angry. That's next. Now, welcome back. A protest in Brussels backed by Flemish far-right parties erupted into violence on Sunday. Some 5,500 protesters took to the streets to oppose a UN migration pact signed in Morocco last week. Belgium's signing of the non-binding pact led to the Flemish nationalist NVA party quitting the government. Demonstrators clashed with police who responded with, as you can see, water cannons and tear gas. A group also tried to storm the European Commission headquarters. Um, pretty violent scenes there in Brussels over this weekend. Let's have a conversation about what it means, uh, why it's happening. Uh, first of all, I'm joined uh, by uh, one of uh, a Belgium MVP, a representative from the NVA, uh, Mark uh, Demischmacher, uh, who, of course, your party recently quit the government over this. Uh, also, we're still joined by Andrew Byrne uh, from The Times and uh, Esther Zatlan, uh, who is a Hungarian uh, journalist with the EU Observer. Mark, let's start with you first of all. Uh, just explain to us, why did we see these people on the streets? What, what's behind the, the protests, at least, if not the violence at the weekends? Well, the protest is against the, uh, the Marrakesh um, um, the Global Compact. Uh, yeah, the, the, it, it has been a debate in the public opinion about this uh, compact. My party, NVA, left uh, the government. 
um, which left us now with a minority uh, government still in place, 50 seats out of 150, so it's a small minority government. Um, yes, people, of course, wanted to, to, to show their, their um, disagreement with, uh, with the, the signing of, of, of yep. the Marrakesh agreement. Uh, the riots, I, I was not there, of course. We didn't organize this protest uh, anyway. Um, I have the impression that some uh, groups infiltrated also this, uh, this protest, as we have seen with the Yellow Vests movement as well. Uh, it, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it is the same kind of you know, rioters who, who try to infiltrate these kind of movements. Uh, so, well, but what, what I can understand is, A, why protest over something that is essentially non-binding? So why the anger? Why, why over something that's non-binding? And second of all, uh, doesn't you probably have to take some form of responsibility, given that members supported this protest, even if it did turn violent, there has to be some form of condemnation for at least the violence? Well, we, we, we condemned the violence. Uh, we distanciated ourselves from, uh, from the protest. We didn't organise it. We didn't mobilise for it. It's not our, uh, our rally. It's not our manifestation. And we condemned, of course, the violence. Um, uh, it, it's, it is non-binding, but it is, um, <laughs> uh, it, it, it is a kind of soft law that, can creep into your jurisdiction anyway, and that is the, the problem we have. There are a number of reasons why we can't support it, but that is one of the most important things. So if you say it is non-binding, it can be true, uh, but but um, it, it, it has, you know, in, in jurisdiction, we, we've seen that in the past, that some these kind of non-binding agreements still creep in, into your legislation and jurisdiction anyway. Cool. Well, is, we haven't just seen those uh, protests in, uh, in Brussels at the weekend. We also saw tear gas and water cannon-filled uh, streets around different European capitals, from the Yellow Vests unrest in Paris, pensioners protesting in Greece, and anti-government demonstrators in Serbia. Also, of course, Hungary, where around 10,000 people braved freezing temperatures to oppose controversial legislation dubbed the Slave Law. It was the largest of four anti-government protesters in Budapest since the ruling for Diz party passed the law last Wednesday. It allows employers to ask workers to do up to 400 hours of overtime a year. Waving Hungarian and European Union flags, the crowd headed from Hero Square towards Parliament and then to the state TV headquarters in a march nicknamed rather festively Merry Christmas, Mr. Prime Minister. But Esther, uh, it may have had a very festive name, but certainly the protests as were not being uh, very warm or festive towards Mr. Orban. What, again, is the, the thought process? It's simply opposition to this so-called slave law. I think the, the protests have been, this time, have been kicked off by this, this slave law because it mobilized a larger number of people than usually uh, who go to these dem demonstrations. But it's not only about that, it's about, I mean, there are five demands that the protesters have put forward and they also call for independent media, independent courts, and for Hungary to join the European uh, prosecutor's office to oversee the correct, fund, uh, correct spending of EU funds. So I think it's, it's more of uh, tensions boiling over in Hungary and eight years of Orbán's government uh, causing all kinds of eruptions and eruptions within the society. And what people have been picking up on, Andrew, is A, that this has united opposition, but B, uh, you know, has Viktor Orbán actually slipped up here? Is mm. this a, a massive kind of misstep by him? Well, the interesting thing from these protests, apart from the fact that they've been sustained in sub-zero temperatures, is that it seems to have brought together the rather disparate elements of the Hungarian opposition, trade unions and others who usually don't cooperate so easily. And I think an interesting historical echo in the protests is that the, the choice of the uh, TV headquarters uh, as a destination for the protests is historical echoes. It was outside the national radio station that the 1956 revolution started. In 2006, there were an occupation of the TV station, which led to violence uh, and eventually, after time, ushered in a new government. And so the protesters are making a very clear statement that this is about, in a sense, the battle for Hungary's future, I think. And I think by targeting media, it's also a message to focus international attention on Orbán's essential monopoly over so, media in, in Hungary. So the big question is, Mark, what, what is going on here? <laughs> you know, we've got Athens, Belgrade, Paris, Brussels, uh, Budapest. What, what, wh why are we seeing this kind of anger coming to the boil in midwinter? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I think, well, you shouldn't con, 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 mix one protest with, with another. I think they are different. Um, but, but in a way, we, like... The protest of the yellow vests, I've seen, I've seen them here in, in, in Belgium as well. Now, the, the, the manifestation of the rally last Sunday. Um, it, it's a bit of feeling that 
people, you know, they live in a globalized world and, world and they don't have, they don't feel they have impact on, 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 the, uh, on the events anymore and on the decision uh, making process uh, anymore. That could be behind it. Uh, in Hungary, of course, it's, an, it's more a national movement against maybe the authoritarian drift there uh, of, of President uh, Orban. Uh, and then you have, of, of course, also the, uh, the protests in, in Catalonia, which are not violent, but yep. uh, also against uh, the authorita authoritarian you know, actions of the Spanish government. So we're going to come back to this in just one second, just because I, I want to focus back just on Brussels uh, for a minute, and particularly this idea of the uh, migration uh, pact. Of course, that is what many people here were protesting, a protest that turned violent uh, yesterday. Uh, and many would say that there is an awful lot of misinformation, particularly on social media, about what the pact means and uh, what its impact would be on EU countries. Let's go to uh, Alex Morgan. He is at the Cube at Euronews headquarters who's been looking through all this. Alex. Well, hey, Darren. Yeah, just listening to the panel there, talking about all these issues, it is a complicated mixing pot, isn't it, in Europe? But let's focus in then on the migration pact and claims being made about it, like this one here by Marina saying, the UN Global Migration Pact is facilitating unlimited migration across the world and making that a human right. Also saying criticism of it will become hate speech. And then look at this, another tweet here saying Europe is under siege, calling on countries to reject this pact. And indeed, in these demonstrations, we saw a lot of elements of far-right politicians uh, like this individual here calling for uh, the times are changing, get rid of Marrakesh. We also saw the hashtag Stop Marrakesh, referring to the decision to adopt this global migration pact. Worth pointing out, though, America, Hungary, Austria, among others, ditched it. They were not interested. America didn't even get involved in the conversations after Donald Trump's inauguration. So what is it? Well, the UN General, uh, the, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez himself, in a tweet, acknowledged the many falsehoods he called them about this. Now, let's dig into it a little bit then. I just want to pull up, if I can, something from the preamble. I'm sure reading preamble of treaties isn't everyone's favorite activity, but this is a key phrase here. This global compact represents a non-legally binding cooperative framework. Basically, summing it up, there will be no new, uh, it, new conditions placed upon countries to actually follow or comply with the content of the document, meaning they're not going to get legally penalized. This is not an adoption of an open door worldwide migration policy coming from the UN. Instead, you could look at it more like this. It is attempting to frame the issue of migration as an issue the world together should work to deal with. Rather than seeing it as something that individual nations should uh, combat on their own, the document, which really is, it's been, I suppose you could say, summed up and characterized by some people as a lot of warm words, but no actual concrete actions. It's more of a vision about where the world should be heading. And I think summarized quite well, just finally here, if I might, by uh, Matteo Villa, who's a migration analyst, saying here, astounding to see the migration pact, an, an innocuous, non-binding pact on managing migration cooperatively seized upon for political ends. So it is worth saying it's touched upon a lot of issues people have, a lot of concerns and conversations going on in Europe, but the actual document itself, well, it doesn't actually change all that much. Uh, Alex, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mark, just really quickly on that point, you know, an innocuous deal that's led to criminal damage, violence on the streets, people's weekends ruined. It's not really worth it, is it? <laughs> I, I, I just can repeat what I, what I said before. People uh, have the feeling that they don't have uh, any impact anymore on the democratic decisions about, about this. Um, there has been no debate. Yeah, there is a lot of fake news, but that even proves that there has been no debate about, uh, about what it really means. Uh, and you can say, yeah, that this, it is non-binding, but it is not open-ended also. So there, there, there can be some consequences in your jurisdictions. Um, judges have uh, proved in the past that they use these kind of agreements to, yeah, to rule in their rulings. Okay. So it, 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 there is not enough distinction, for instance, in my view, between legal and illegal okay. uh, migrations. And you can go on. So it is not, it, it's, it's not okay. open-ended. Okay. And um, we need a, a real debate about it. Um, just very, very quickly, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, conspiracy theories about UN migration plots are as, as old as, well, almost as old as the UN. They, came, they were 
a big thing in the US and the far right in the 1990s. This whole conspiracy around the Global Compact started in Hungary a year ago with Orbán's government, and it's a useful prop for right-wing movements who want to bolster their votes ahead of elections. Great, thank you very much indeed. Interesting discussion, and we are expecting those protests, particularly in Budapest, in Hungary, to carry on during the week. It'll be interesting to see uh, what happens next uh, weekend. Uh, notable that actually with the Yellow Vest movement in France this weekend, the, uh, the steam seems to have, mm. have left that movement and, uh, and the protests petered out somewhat. Coming up, though, we're going to take a quick break uh, and we're going to have celebrations as the curtains have closed on the UN's COP24. An agreement, apparently, has been reached to press forward with the Paris Climate Pact. The question is, will it be enough? We'll have more on that next. Now, welcome back to Raw Politics. In Poland, negotiators at COP24 have finally reached an agreement that will put the Paris Climate Pact into action in 2020. Despite last-minute snags, uh, they pushed through the two-week conference into overtime. 196 states signed onto a rulebook that would regulate how countries cut carbon. So is it a moment of celebration or yet again a question of will real progress actually be made? To discuss this, we're joined by Maeve McMahon. She is Euronews's uh, Brussels correspondent and is all across this. We're also still joined uh, by uh, Mark uh, Demersmarker, uh, an MEP here in Belgium, and Andrew Byrne uh, from the Sunday Times. Maeve, this is incredibly complicated. Uh, Please explain, please explain well, your question, what has should, happened. Should we be celebrating? Absolutely not. I've been speaking to scientists and uh, NGOs like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth over the last couple of days, and they say, look, we are all doomed. They do not think that much progress was made at all at COP24. All they did was put together a rule book on how to implement Paris that was put together, of course, back in uh, 2015. They would argue that we should have moved on much more because there's only a couple of years yet left to save the planet. And the irony is the fact that this took place in Katowice, a mining region. It was, in fact, sponsored as well by mining Yeah, I think, I think they, had, they, had coal, they had literally... Um, coal at the at the climate change conference. Mm. Colleagues of mine that were there, they said that they were coughing and spluttering and had sore throats uh, because of it. They said it was a glum, uh, bleak event and they said it was like sitting on the Titanic and the iceberg was coming <laughs> Well, not everyone is as pessimistic as that, it must be said, Maeve. Uh, let's hear from, uh, I think, one of the leaders of uh, this summit uh, who's been uh, reveling, I think, in the fact that they've managed at least to reach an agreement. Let's have a look. With approximately 200 countries in the room, it is not easy to find agreement on a deal so specific and so technical. But in these circumstances, every single step forward is a big achievement. And through this package, you have made a thousand little steps forward together. You can feel proud. You can feel proud. There we go. Uh, should we be feeling proud, Andrew? Pride, maybe, maybe not the right term for it. But I mean, this this does keep the Paris Climate Agreement alive, which is something. And I think being re realistic, this is a consensus-based organization with 196 states. That includes, you know, Saudi Arabia. It includes Donald Trump's United States. So it's probably the most we could expect from an a, a, a sort of a summit like this. I think maybe what's more interesting to watch in the months and years ahead is what happens on a bilateral level between states, between the West and the developing world, between the West and China, about exchanging technology transfers to help countries uh, grow their economies in a more sustainable way. Uh, and that kind of activity, because frankly, we've tried these massive big tent international conferences and they're an essential piece of the puzzle, but they're not actually going to deliver really the coup de grace against climate change. Uh, and Mark, isn't the point here with the United States stepping back, uh, China has stepped forward to a degree, but the European Union is also trying to, to fill that space somewhat, aren't they? Well, yeah, the, the European Union has tried to, to, to play a kind of leader's role, but you see that, you know, in, it, yes, they try, but it conceals also the disagreement within the European uh, Union. Eh? There, there's no, uh, there is no agreement within the European as Euro Union as well with countries like Poland who are uh, a little a bit m not so ambitious at all. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a deal, yes, and that's all uh, we can say about it. It's, there are some technical, there's some technical progress, but we really miss the ambition and we are approaching mm. the point of no return. And, I'm afraid we will, uh, we will yeah, soon reach that point and there is no return uh, back then. The climate change Mark is happening are, fast and, and the political Mark process is so slow, but the climate change yeah, is and happening. And you're a politician and people in Belgium are generally concerned. 
thousands of people took to the streets recently for a huge peaceful protest. Yes, and there's another one planned, uh, Darren, for the 27th of uh, January because people are worried that but, governments but, but shouldn't, are not... Shouldn't we, so, instead of being so pessimistic about this, shouldn't we mm. be pleased that, you know, countries as far apart as Russia and the United States, from Saudi Arabia to Israel, you know, that are genuinely, OK, in incremental steps, but are genuinely working to achieve some type of agreement on climate change, at least mm. a recognition of how important almost everyone knows that it is, no? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think so. And look, this, this sets the parameters for the next few years. It sets a, a, a floor on the, on the work that needs to be done. And I think the action and the challenge for the next few years is for individual countries and companies to build on that and, and be more ambitious. And for individual citizens. We all have our responsibility. I remember when I moved to Brussels, the first EU summit that I ever attended was all about climate change. But since then, there was the Greek debt crisis and another array, a couple of years of crisis. So they've and never it's, managed it's to never put it the agenda on since. the table again, only a tiny little footnote. Even though Greenpeace did try to, um, to put it on the table last Thursday and Friday, they had a stunt where they blocked off heads of state on their way into that summit in a very well orchestrated stunt that we were behind the scenes of. They were trying to get EU governments and heads of state to change the course on climate change. Well, there we go. A uh, pretty pessimistic panel there, must be said, <laughs> on what came out of Poland uh, at the weekend. Now, let's turn to something that is uh, particularly, I think, controversial, or certainly sparking debate. It is Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission. He, of course, is a figurehead of the EU, the most powerful man here in Brussels. But his entrance at the European Council Summit this weekend has been making headlines for all the wrong reasons. We're kind of all slightly stunned by silence. We don't quite know what to say about that. What, what's your official initial reaction oh, was, when you see I it? I think it's so inappropriate. It's cringeworthy. It's horrific to see the, the Jean-Claude Juncker, the head of the European Commission, do that. I'm mm. ashamed. What do we think? I mean, I think you need, uh, you need a psychologist on the sofa to analyse what actually happened there. I mean, I, I guess he thinks he's, he's having a laugh. He's, he's making light of things. And I don't want to be a killjoy, but it's bizarre behaviour. And he's yeah. lost it a bit now that he knows that he's going out next November. He's kind of maybe thinks he can do what he wants. Well, yeah, should we, should we, should we, should we contextualise this a little bit? When he, when he slapped Victor Orban, lots of people here thought it was terribly funny. Yeah, well, I, I, was, I, I was going to say that. Yeah, it's not the first time he does this kind of things. Is he really like that? Mm -hmm. And he indeed needs a psychologist, I think. Yeah. But with a female <laughs> employee of the council like that. No, but remember, that man was put in that position because the majority of people back in 2014 voted for the European People's Party. Yeah. So that's why they have that man yeah. in that position. He well, indeed, but uh, he is stepping down next week. He's at least next a unique, November. He is a unique character here in Brussels. Um, thank you, guys. We're going to take a quick break uh, because coming up next, we're going to launch our brand new show. It's called Your Call. It's a show that is all about you, and we want to know what you think about whether it's the protests in Europe or that second Brexit referendum. You can use the hashtag more politics. We'll be chatting about it live here on Euronews and we'll be streaming it on uh, line. So join us after the break because that is uh, what we'll be talking about but we'll also have what has been keenly anticipated uh, is the moments, uh, the raw moments, the highlight of the year. Uh, we'll be looking at which ones you've chosen to go out and end the show on. Join us after the break.